this week, I thought it'd be really good to um, to to hear from somebody else. So um, I'm going to have a conversation with uh, Carl Knights. So before I introduce Carl, Carl's um, an autistic writer with cerebral palsy, and his poetry and prose has appeared in the Guardian, the Dark Horse, Under the Radar, the North. Um, he's 23 and he lives in Suffolk. So that's the bit that Carl has sent me. But what I'll say about Carl is I think he's he's a really really interesting guy and someone that I'm I'm really happy to to be talking to this afternoon. Um, we should both be in in America at the moment, so it'll be nice to chat virtually. But we should be in in um, in New York at the uh, Zoe Glossier conference, which is the um, uh, uh, conference for poets with disabilities. And, and Carl and I were part of the. Um, the cohort this year. So um, enough of me. Let's bring uh, Carl in. So Carl, I think we know how to do this. So if you um, if you make a request to join, I'll figure out if I can do this, and we'll bring you into the uh, into the chat. This is just me looking at a screen now. Right. This is. Let's see if this works. And in three, two, one. Hello, Carl. He's on his way. Hi, Carl. How are you doing? Yeah. What's up? I'm good. How are you? Good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's really nice to chat virtually, even if not, even if not, we're in America, sort of eating yeah. slices of pizza and no. ordering <laughs> coffee from fancy establishments and stuff like that. Yeah. No, we've um, saved it for for 2021. So. That's right. So if we're um, if, if we're not in if we're not in New York, where where do I find you at the moment? Um, I am in so I'm uh, in Suffolk. I'm you know basically every uh, I, I live in a tiny village basically in Suffolk. Um, so that's where you can find me. Um, <laughs> I'll be in, right. in, in. Don't give too much information out, Carl, because you're going to get a lot of people who are probably yeah. having a knock on your door. <laughs> yeah, no, disability obsessives come. come, come <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. They're going to be looking at what's on the back of your shelf and wonder if they can borrow a book. So, yeah. <laughs> have you um I, I, have you done what I've done, which is actually um, rearrange all the bookshelves behind me to be to be one of those annoying people that's like, right, where are, where do I position my camera so you can show how many books I've got? Or is that, is that <laughs> no. a new book, bookshelf no, behind you? No, this is no, this is all just really old. I, 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 actually, it's a lot of disability literature behind me and it, behind me. So yeah. Um, yeah, this is sort of the, the inner sanctum, if you like. <laughs> Where, uh... Lovely. Well, in that case, then let's 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 part of that because I, I, that is definitely something I want to talk to. Because one of the things I, I find most fascinating about you is this, this the, is one of the projects you've been working on. And I think um, uh, I was just telling my wife before I I joined that I was like, God, I hope we've got enough time because there's actually so much that I could talk to you about. But I think that, mm. that project in particular, um, one of the things I, just before we get into that, I think, um, and um, I'm going to ask you to read some poems as well. So I think that's going to be really, really good. But yeah, how have you found, how have you found lockdown? It seems to be the first question that anyone asks in these types of things. But I think it's, I think it's important to kind of share how, how different people are getting on. Yeah, I think for me, it's, I think I'm, in many ways a kind of typical tale of lockdown where, where for me it's mostly I'm a freelance journalist by day so all my work vanished overnight and it hasn't returned so it's mostly just trying to stave off boredom really um, yeah is, is the main sort of task for me at the moment it seems um I mean I mean the only plus of, of lockdown is that I'm certainly reading a lot but but that's pretty much the only plus of it really <laughs> so yeah so yeah it's sort of it's yeah I'm, I'm sort of in the same boat as everyone else really which and is, have you how are you sort of finding tackling the boredom have you got have you been doing anything to kind of try and alleviate that in any way yeah I've been sort of I've been sort of doing I guess what I would normally do really which is sort of obsessively drill into projects or to like say one project was going to get a bid for arts council funding down the line. So I'm sort of taking lockdown as a time to work more on that yeah. as, a, as an excuse to, to, to work more on that. Cause I don't have an excuse to not do it now. <laughs> so um, I've been sort of doing that and, and, and mostly just trying to keep myself as busy as I can really, which yeah, it's sort of difficult to sit with all the spare time, I think. How have you, that spare time, have you found that that has, 
I've, I've read that some people have found actually that spare time, having so much spare time, quite, quite um, inhibiting towards creativity. And actually mm-hmm. that it's kind of, you know, there's not that stimulus that you're finding from being outside in the, in the world. Have you, you know, do you, is there, I've, I've particularly found like, actually, oh, I've got these projects that I could be working on, but at the same time, I'm like, do you know what? I'm really sort of struggling to get motivated to do that. Whereas before lockdown, I couldn't stop working on these projects and I didn't have enough time yeah. to spend on them. Mm-hmm. And I've heard that from a lot of creative people as well, where they, I'm, he- I'm hearing from almost every creative person I know that essentially there's something about our current situation that saps all energy away including creative energy so so you kind of feel a bit stuck in that you can't sort of make something out of it you can't write like say for example it's been really interesting to watch people try and write sort of lockdown poems um and and whether they succeed or not or or whether they sort of get the job done yeah um and yeah it's it's sort of interesting for me i'm very much someone who i know sort of two types of poets in a way i know the poets who are sort of slow and steady in their creativity and and in their productivity and they write um sort of not a huge amount but they do it over a long period of time so it's a constant sort of stream and then i know another type of poet which is where i fall in in which is the group who write in massive bursts and then have massive dry periods and then another burst where they'll write sort of dozens of things and then dry period and so on. So Yeah, I read that actually. One of the, I was reading some of your many articles, which I would encourage people to go and um, search out when this is finished. And, and that's one of the things you spoke about. Um, I'm also interested though, in terms of, because coming to the articles, one of the things that you've, you've written about before is, is um, visibility of people with disabilities and, and, and feeling seen. And mm-hmm. uh, you wrote a great article a couple of years ago, I think, in The Guardian about yeah. um, uh, when the disabled emojis and yeah. um, wheelchair mm-hmm. Barbie and, and a ramp for the Barbie house came in and, and yeah. how that enables people to feel, to feel seen and visible. And I wonder how you feel that that impact, like lock, the, the impact of that on lockdown, because I'm conscious yeah. of the fact, in some ways, I feel like, and I never knew that this would be a side effect of lockdown, mm-hmm. is that when I've been doing these Zoom chats, it's not Zoom, sorry, when I've been doing the Zoom chats yeah. or, or things like Instagram Live, mm-hmm. a part of my personality, which I've tried to maybe kind of um, distance myself from previously, I'm, I'm losing on this screen because I'm a, a white, middle-class right, yeah. male in here. And the bit that you can't see is the wheelchair. And I feel like I have to keep talking about this because when I'm reading poems about my disability or wheelchair, um, and I wonder how many people, you know, aren't necessarily seeing that kind of things on, on the Zoom chats because it doesn't enable you to see the whole person. And mm. um, in many ways, I feel like it's been helpful for accessibility because I feel like enjoying more things than I've been able to do before. Mm. Um, but I don't know. I know that's not been the case for everybody. And I'd be interested to take your Hear your take on this and then we'll then we'll take a point from you yeah i think i think the main thing i'm hearing especially from a lot of from two fields in particular where especially musicians and poets where they're saying that their creative indi- their sort of creative industries have never been as accessible as as now which which then brings the question of will it remain as as accessible that's right. Um, when, as say, for example, I saw today that um, students had been asking Cambridge University well. yeah. f- to record lectures for years and years and years, and they kept giving the students a line about um, copyright and sort of infringement and things like that. And then, as soon as the wider population needed that service, they immediately did it without any right. sort of he- hesitation. Yeah. So I think, so I think there is a real concern about how um how accessible is it going to remain when when for lack of a better term when the able body don't need it anymore yeah and, and it is a very real i mean i i hope it stays as accessible as it, as it sort of seems to be emerging as but yeah that there's that fear or sort of um a fear or a uh kind of hesitance about will it remain that way and, I think that's that's a fear that I think is 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 
grounded in in a sense of actual um, reality for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I think Absolutely. when you look back at, I look back to the 2012 Paralympics, I've spoken about this this before, is that, you know, I saw so many changes in, in London when I lived there. You know, pubs changing their names to reflect the, the sports that were being played and mm. um, temporary ramps being put down. And then there was no legacy. The week after the Paralympics, all this stuff yeah. came back again. And I have a fear that, that lockdown and when we ease ourselves out of this, may some of that may happen is that and i think you're absolutely on the money cambridge um university is a really good example particularly because also i think there's lots of venues where you maybe have emailed before and said Mm -hmm. is there wheelchair access or have you got this kind of access and they say i'm really sorry it's an old building and there's nothing at all we can do Mm -hmm. and those venues are now online live streaming um their their things and it's a it's it's a monetary thing rather than a you know, because mm. they want to still be seen, they want to still have a presence. It's not because they think, oh, actually, let's use this opportunity to become more accessible. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fascinating. We can talk on that. Let's hear a poem. That's that's what, yeah, let's okay. let's hear a poem from you. Um, do you want to hear one of mine or do you want to hear another poet's poem? Let's hear one of yours first. Yeah, let's okay. hear one of yours. Uh, one of mine. This is a short, a lot of my poems are really short. Because I, I think I, I have a really short attention span as it is, and I think my poems kind of reflect that, where they're really short. And this is one that appeared in the North about six months ago or so, called Kin. Um, it, it kind of explains itself, really. I was teaching, and then I saw him out the window in his walking frame, playing football with the other kids. I saw the way his legs bent inwards how his toes touched the floor before the heel. I wanted to catch his eye, have a chat, and show him my splints. Lovely. And that locks into a a lot of what we were saying about seeing yourself and and image and and all that kind of stuff, which I hadn't hadn't realised that when I picked it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, very good. It's, um, yeah, it, it actually reminds me of a, a poem that um, I don't know when that you'll, you'll read it later, but the, it was in the, um, the, the Verve anthology of this year that um, I was reading before, before they started that I really enjoyed. And one thing you said before that poem started, that it, a lot of your poems are small. And again, one of the things we can come to in a second is that you've done this incredible research project yeah. where you've kind of charted a database of, of Am I right in saying every poet with a disability from well, all the way back not, to Saturn or yeah, something like that? De- definitely not every poet, a lot of poets, There's, certainly. Yeah. And in that basically, I think every, every week or so, I find a handful more poets where basically at the moment there's, mm-hmm. and basically the, the archive project started because I wanted to find disabled poets and I found a lot of anthologies and, and they were brilliant. But I sort of thought, okay, who in terms of the backwards look and in terms of history is there who's not not necessarily a disabled voice but 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 someone who was writing while disabled essentially um and i sort of obsessively started keeping a list really of just basically I'd, i'd note down a name and what their dates were and um any sort of books that they had um and eventually it grew and grew and grew until I had a very large kind of list. And, and now, How many is in there at the moment? And now at the moment, there's over 250. I think it's about 264 poets. Right. Um, and that's basically going back to, say, BCE um, to the present to the present day. So, yeah. so there's a lot of ground there, and there's a lot of well-known names, and there's a lot of names that have just totally faded away. Um, yeah. Who would you say is there? Is there a point in there that may surprise people? That's kind of someone that they've got on their bookshelves and wouldn't think, oh, I didn't, I didn't realise that there would be someone that was writing about disability or with a disability. Um, I think probably a good example is someone who a lot of people study in school or in university is um, someone like Lord Byron. Um, who had a sort of clubbed foot and wore, and and you can see his cast. It's it, it's in a museum, and and you can yeah. Google it, and there's an image, and it looks like it's this horrific kind of 18th century iron cast. And interestingly, his last work was about disability, um, a really? play called the the Deformed Transformed. Um, and you know that's not 
necessarily taught in sort of curriculums and things like that it's just it's just not there so do you think there's a reason for that then do you think that you, you, that there's a you know do you think that might have dissuaded part of his popularity if maybe they'd focused on the disability or some of that writing i think, think that was a conscious yeah, I, move or subconscious I think, maybe I, th I think there's two sides to it where I think there's the one side of where there's a, histor a historical complicity in silence where, say, in, in Lord Byron's case, he went to extraordinary lengths to hide his disability, um, as that was what you did in, in his century. Um, you just simply didn't you know, do yeah. it it wasn't sort of an open thing. Or, or he wasn't doing Instagram live. <laughs> no, he, he wasn't doing Instagram live. It's a radically different sort of time. But yeah, he, so, so, so there's an element of where scholars have sort of been on Byron's side in a sense of sort of, okay, if he kept it secret or kept it relatively hushed and will follow suit. But then there's now, now, especially in this set century, um, a, a body of criticism has sort of emerged where you know that's starting to be taken into account but but I, I think we're quite far away from that yeah. being being in the curriculum uh, or or a part of the story like say for example Byron's sexuality or his sort of um, his or the things that he did in his life um, are all up for grabs in sort of seminar rooms, but for whatever reason, disability is off the table. So. That's right. Which is how it how it often comes across, doesn't it? You know, it's um, mm. uh, it's, it's often one of those things that's kind of left out. And and even in in modern art, I'd, in um, other art forms, the mm. one of the things I was I was really pleased. Well, not pleased. I was I was interested in that. I read in the article that you wrote about emojis and, and Barbie was. Mm. Um, was the, was the Brian Cranston film uh, The Upside, where yes, um, uh, Brian Cranston, who people may know as Walter White from Breaking Bad, mm -hmm. he's playing a um, a chat with paralysis, and it's based on the, um, uh, the a French, French film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, and I, I I think I'm in your camp of thinking that um, you know disability still seems to be one of the few places that you're able to go. And yeah. uh, I think, as you call it, and the term is, is cripping up, so you can still do that and mm. are celebrated for it. Yeah. I mean, and it's only fairly recently, you know, you see like Eddie Redmayne winning Oscars for it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. uh, I, I think the argument for me doesn't wash in the sense of, um, you know, you would be able to find fairly talented actors with a disability that could have played that part. And mm. I don't think it would have impacted too much on the box office. And I think that... His argument was, "Your, it's having a greater exposure by the fact that I'm in this, I'm in this film, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think that's that's interesting. That, you know, that that is still somewhere that is on the where people are still prepared to go and, and think it's acceptable to do that. Mm. And it, and even in poetry, where I've lost count of the amount of times where I open a magazine now, and there's a poem which is by." for lack of a better term, an able-bodied poet, and it's in a disabled voice. Yeah. And it, I know just last week I, I opened up a poet's book and the first poem was in this disabled voice and I just stopped reading. I was just, you know, <laughs> because it happens so much. That's right. And it still occurs even in, you know, large sort of magazines and, it, and, and it's still very much a thing on, on the literary scene still. We'll come back to that in a second, but maybe um, let's, shall we have another poem? Um, do, you yes. want to, do you want to choose someone from your, um, maybe the archive that you've been collecting? Yes. Um, yes, I'll read something by a guy called Mizoka Shiki, um, who is a Japanese poet. Um, and he's known, actually, he died in 1902 at 34. And he's known in Japan as, as one of the masters of haiku. Um, he, and, and funnily enough, he's um, the word haiku comes from him. Um, wow. Before him, haiku was known as haiku, which, which right. was which was slightly larger. Um, and then Shiki came along, and he wrote what we now call haiku. Um, he had uh, he caught tuberculosis, and which spread to his spine. Um, 
and he was paralyzed as a result of that. And what Shiki managed to do was he managed to write massive amounts of haiku, like thousands and thousands of them, from his bed, essentially. And he sort of made the sort of sick bed, for lack of a better term, um, a sort of viable literary landscape. And he's absolutely brilliant. Um, and in and the translation I'm reading from is by Burton Watson um, from, a, from a book that's just called Mezo Koshiki Selected Poems. And I thought rather than read one haiku, because that'd be a bit of a cop out, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd strung some together. So I'll just read, okay. and they're all dated. So I'll just read the dates. Lovely. 1899. With the help of a cane, I actually stood up bush clover blossoms 1898 a dream in sickness i was so happy i'd climbed mount fuji feet trembling on its summit and then the dream ended 1899 i who listened to a man tell how he climbed mount fuji and rub my skinny legs 1896 i keep asking how deep the snow's gotten all, all I can think of is lying here in a house with all this snow. And then finally from, from the autumn of 1897 called After I'm Dead. After I'm Dead, tell them I was a persimmon eater who liked haiku. Oh, wow. They're, they're, they're beautiful. And they, they, go, they flow together so well as well, don't they? In the same mm-hmm. way that you put them together. That, that's really... I'm fascinated by that because you said something before you um, you read your poem that you tend to write short poems and you write in verse. And I've been reading um, quite a few um, poets with disabilities when they talk about their poems that they also read and write, sorry, in um, short form poems and, and in verse. And, and for part of the reason is that, you know, if they're dealing with, with pain or um, mm-hmm. uh, concentration issues or, you know, they're, they're kind of dealing with fatigue, that actually the ability to sit down and write an epic poem of yeah. whatever, or, you know, reams and reams of prose is actually really difficult. And so that ability to just kind of, in, in moments of clarity in between um, pain or medication or whilst waiting for something to happen, you get these little fire of, of poetry down there. And um, I'd be interested out of the poems, that you, the poets that you've been uh observing over the, those 264 how many of those you think are actually fairly short in the in the structure or if that is a thing that you've seen through for all the way from the haikus up to the modern day that certainly yeah it certainly is a theme where very few go over a page um but then there are people who are on the other end of the spectrum where there are a select few who wrote epics or, or, or what we now think of as epics that go to sort of hundreds of pages. Um, so, it's, yeah, there's sort of a, a wide enough range there that, that you can basically find a poem of any length, really. But, but I agree, there is a tendency toward the sort of shorter, li- toward the shorter sort of lyric, I think. Um, and there's, yeah, and, it's, and there's a lot, in, to say about sort of access of, of writing and things like that but um yeah that there but yeah to sort of answer your question yeah that there is um a tendency toward the shorter kind of poem but, and i'm really struck because on, on the you know there might be someone that's listening and say wow 264 books that you found with poets written by disabilities i didn't know there were so many and on the one hand that sounds a lot and if you go into the poetry library or on the south bank and you think yeah, you know it, you said you've been charting this since since BC times. So mm-hmm. actually, in all that time, 264 poets out of the entire canon of poetry out there yeah, is not that much. It isn't really, a is lot. It? No. It isn't a lot. Mm-hmm. And what do you think we can do then in terms of, of visibility? Where do you think disability poetry is, is going? What do you think um, the future of that could be? I think it's definitely, I mean, I would hesitate to say that it's having a moment because it's had moments before. In, in that, say, for example, there was an anthology that came out in the 80s um, from the US that got a fair amount of press and there, and there was a fair amount, amount of buzz about it. And then it just it just vanished. Um, 
Uh, yeah, Carl, can you um, can you repeat the name of that the um, the the anthology if you know that? Someone's just yes, that yes. The the anthology is called um, Towards Solomon's Mountain, I think. Um, came out via a university press, I think, in the late eighties. Um, and yeah, it's quite, sorry, I've just totally forgotten the question. Where, where, yeah, of, 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 oh, yeah, of where it's going, of, yeah, of where it's going. Where I think it's developing so quickly that it's difficult to tell. Like, like, say, for example, and there's different trajectories in different countries. So, say, for example, there's a lot of disabled work or work from poets who are disabled coming out of Canada right now. Um, and there's an, there's an anthology that, that just came out of Canada from a small press um, called Imaginary Safe House. Um, and that, you know, has just appeared. And, and, and these poets are all, I think they're all younger than me. So it's, it's sort of developing so quickly and has such different trajectories according to countries. Like, say, you have the Canadian anthology. There's been an Australian anthology. There's been an African anthology of all these different disabled literatures. And they're all on different sort of trajectories in terms mm. of the imagery that they use or in terms of the references that they're drawing from. Um, and even in terms of, say, you have UK poets and, the, and, and then you have poets in, in the US where they're drawing from different cultures um, in terms of uh, the, the disabled lived experience. Um, and, and yeah, sometimes it can feel like sometimes it can feel like you're in a moment. We're having a moment if you're in that moment. So for us, it might feel like yeah. disability yeah. poetry because because social media enables us to connect more with people. Um, mm -hmm. But whether or not that has a wider sphere than maybe the people that are in that in that area is 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 I'm not so sure. Uh, that brings me to to Zoe Glossier because obviously that's where mm -hmm. we should be this week in America yeah. with um, mm -hmm. uh, a number of disabled poets from, from across America and, and, and ourselves. Um, what was it that attracted you to, to that? What made you want to apply? I think what attracted me to it was, was two things. I think the first was that I hadn't heard of anything like it before. And there's, and there's the element of innovation about it. Um, and then the second thing was I realised that while I had interviewed other disabled poets and been amongst other disabled poets one-on-one -on -one. I'd never been in a group of disabled poets or I or every workshop environment that I've been in I was always the only disabled poet there so, so yeah, I was exactly. kind of interested to to invert that equation to then have okay what what does a workshop of disabled poets look like and how does your work change in mm. that environment of say for example if i am in a in a workshop and i'm the only disabled person there i'm going to have to explain a lot about my poems or, or what's in them or what they're about or, or you know all this kind of stuff whereas uh, theoretically theoretically amongst a sort of predominantly disabled audience i don't have to do that or, that's right or, or my work changes um, in terms of like what's on the page hasn't changed, but the way that it's received and heard and read, it sort of shifts. Um, so and that was one of the that was one of the most glorious experiences last year as a as a mm -hmm. two thousand and um, nineteen fellow. Um, you know, was was very much that I think being in the room and feeling like on the one hand it was terrific because you think wow this is amazing, and on the other hand you think wow on the other side of the on the other side of the world, there's people still having the same experiences and still having the same frustrations. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I, I learned so much that I took into my into my writing, and I'm sure it will continue in a online form because you know why why should it not? Because we're we're proving that it can it can have a, a moment as I, as I expected. Um, that's gone very very quickly, and we're at kind of at the half an hour mark already <laughs> can we um before we finish um and um before we finish we'll get another poem, but also. If there's anyone who's really interested in this, I know someone's had asked a question about as well the um, the, the database that you've produced. And um, mm -hmm. just to clarify, it's, there's, you're not saying that this is a, a complete collection of every disabled no, poem that's ever been written. Not. This is the no. ones that you've, you've identified. So, mm -hmm. but you've created a database of, of almost 250 
disabled um, poets going back centuries. Um, and that's not to say that there, there's probably thousands of people with disabilities writing poetry at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this kind of shows that it's a, a real historical um, collection of, 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 of what's out there, I think, which is, which is brilliant. So if anyone's interested in this or anyone wants to know a little bit more about you, they can follow you. What's your, um, your yeah, Instagram I'm, is? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm in, I'm in a dark wood blog because someone took in a dark wood before me <laughs> and, I, and I'm on Twitter. I'm at in a dark wood. Um, you should be able to just find me just by typing my name, really. It's just yeah. Carl. And I'll, right. I'll share all this as well afterwards. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm always open to, you know, any sort of questions about the project or what what's happening with it or where it can be accessed and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I really hope there's a, I, I hope there's a, a home for it somewhere. That, that, oh, yeah. I think it's a phenomenal resource that's really, really needed. Um, mm -hmm. Lovely. Shall we, have a, shall we have a final point from yourself, Carl? Yes, um, I'm, I'm tempted to read something that's not mine, but but I'll read something that's mine. I should. Good. <laughs> and, and this is and this is a poem which came out of the archive experience um, called Arthur Honeyman's Birthday, 3 a.m. 1970. Um, Arthur Honeyman was a poet. Um, he wrote a children's book, the name of which escapes me, in the 70s about a kid in a wheelchair who sells light bulbs door to door um and he and he was a poet and i found this incident um in an art in archive um and i wrote a poem about it arthur honeyman's birthday 3 a.m 1970 arthur honeyman wanted a pancake he was pushed by a friend who was deafened by vietnam the waitress looks at them and nods at and nods to her boss she wanders over. We'll get the pancakes, Arthur's friend says. The waitress stares, then, then looks at her, at her shoes. You're disturbing the other patrons, she says. A family looks over. We only want the... But before Arthur's friend can finish, the waitress says, I can't believe that something like you would come someplace where, where people are trying to eat. I won't serve you because I don't even know if you're a human being. I thought people like you were supposed to die at birth. Arthur's, Arthur turns to his friend and says, why is the waitress talking about you this way? I don't think you look any worse than you usually do. Then the waitress says, if you don't leave, I'll have to call the police. Go ahead, Arthur said, call them. Right. And they were arrested um, really? under, under something called an ugly law, which basically right. prohibited um, anyone who was unsightly from sort of being in public, really. And that was in 1970. But oh, wow. Thank you so much for that. That was a, that was a fabulous poem. And we, we, are, we, are, we are here and we're seeing and we're sharing these poems. And I think that's, that's one of the magic of, of social media that enables to kind of share some of these some of these experiences. I think that was, um, yeah, a really fantastic point to, to end on. I'm actually, I'm going to do a little screen grab of us and then so yeah, I'll, do, I'll quickly do that. <laughs> Magic. Thank you so much, Carl. I'll, um, what it's I'll say, we're, gonna, we're, we're trying to figure this out ourselves, I think, as, as disabled poets mm -hmm. on online. And um, I think, you know, we're, we're conscious of, you know, I, I'm, I'm delighted to be having kind of these kind of conversations and about accessibility and um mm -hmm. i think as a as a person with a disability myself i'm trying to kind of feel my way through this format and and how we can how we can make it more accessible so we're going to try and see if technology works with us see if we can download this video and then yes you've opened to try and caption it and yeah um, i can do that yeah yeah so, i think that's that's something that's really important i think if we can um you know it's by no means is this are we have we got it right but i think it's technology yeah, no, that we're trying to do things and caption and you know, ways that we can try and bring um, sign language into this or, mm. or different formats. And, and if people have got suggestions, then please do email and comment and let us know maybe how we can make these more accessible and that would be great. But thanks, Carl. Really appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Take care and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks. You bye as bye. Well. Cheers. Thanks.